Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome here to the Lee School. I'm Andrew Lansley. I'm chair of the Cambridgeshire Development Forum. Uh, and I want to start just by saying a big welcome to all of you. Uh, the purpose of our careers fair on the built environment, building the future, is to give to those young people who are thinking about their careers, potentially through the uh, discipline of geography and the academic possibilities in world planning and development, to give you a sense of what that looks like, what the opportunities may be, what the work experience opportunities may look like, what the paths that people have taken uh, look like, and how you might think about your own careers and futures. At the Cambridgeshire Development Forum, we are based, as the name implies, in Cambridgeshire, and over the last eight years we've been working on how we deliver some of the great places to live here in Cambridgeshire. And you can see it around you. We are one of the places in the country where people look for the award-winning uh, developments. Uh, and we are, one of, we are potentially the place they look um, for where some of the most important developments take place for the economy and our future. So planners are central to that. From, uh, I used to be a member of parliament here. I'm now a member of the House of Law, so I've been involved in legislation. Uh, not often, actually, everybody agrees about something. But everybody agrees at the moment that we need more planners. So the Labour Party at their conference just a few weeks ago said, we need 300 more planners. The government is saying we need the planning departments to have more resources so that we can deliver the planning that we want. Why do we want that? Because actually, what we want is not only to deliver our plans efficiently and quickly, but we want actually to produce great places to live, and that is a tough job, and it requires people who have a real commitment to that. And that's what we're all about. Can I say a big thank you to the leaders for this, um, having us here uh, and for en enabling this to happen. During this first session, you're going to hear from a number of speakers, at the end of which I hope you will take another opportunity <coughs> to talk to all of those who are exhibitors here from various organisations. I'll talk about that uh, when we get to the end of the first session. What I want to start with is to introduce Andrew uh, Taylor, who is uh, one of the leading planners uh, in, the, in the profession and indeed in the industry, uh, and has been a member and a, and a supporter of the Cambridgeshire Development Forum over these years. Uh, so, Andrew, from Vistry, Planning Director for the Vistry Group, can I hand the floor to you for the first session? Um, but thank you very much for coming. Uh, and as Andrew said, we certainly need lots more planners. So, um, I've got a few minutes just to talk a little bit about what I've done in my career, what planning is, and the built environment, and the importance in trying to infuse you. This is a fantastic career to think about, at least, or to, to move into. So what is planning? I started my career uh, 10 years ago in local government, so I worked in local government for about 19 years. Starting off doing, as I'll show you in a minute, porch extensions and side extensions to houses, and then starting working up, thinking about the larger scale developments, um, and then on to some large new um, urban regeneration schemes. But planning does get involved in thinking about the, the plans on the screen, the maps, the future of the place whether that's in the local planning sections and thinking about the, the new development that's going to happen over the next 10, 15 years in an area, or actually then when the planning applications come in, thinking about the balance of the uses of that, thinking about where the shops should go, or the employment, or the schools, or the houses, and then the type of houses and the design. You really get involved in creating new places. And that's what I find is incredibly interesting about planning, as what's kept me interested since I started back in 97, which is probably before um, lots of you were, were, were born. Um, but that's how I started uh, planning then when I was in Rochester Council, and I've moved around different councils, and then, as Andrew said, moved into the developer side. But in uh, planning in itself is thinking about the regulation. So government has said there were these rules across the country so individuals can't do what they want specifically in relation to their houses. So somebody has to regulate that, somebody has to decide. So the planners in local authorities are thinking about the effects on their neighbours, the effects on trees sometimes. Around here there's a lot of effects on the water, you might have seen in the news about a lack of water in the area. But thinking about the design or the way things sit within the street and within the area. So it's really getting involved in some of the details, but you also get involved and it sometimes isn't quite so interesting or, or comfortable in the, in the disputes between neighbours. 
and you'll get an argument from one neighbour saying they don't want an extension, and then obviously the people who put it forward saying that. And the planner may, is the decision maker. They're the ones that weigh up all the different issues between what the neighbour might be thinking or the parish council says, um, and uh, or even the MP sometimes we get, we talked about being an MP, you get MPs sometimes uh, making comments about applications, and the planner is the one that tries to make those decisions and weigh up all those issues. So you go from the some small scale stuff, which can be incredibly um, controversial, to much larger scale stuff. So this is the south side of Cambridge, this is uh, Great Knighton or Clay Farm, depending on what you want to call it. And this was a, a large urban extension that my company did, uh, working obviously with the council here, or two councils, because it crossed the boundary between uh, Cambridge City and South Cambridgeshire. So development of two and a half thousand houses, and then the schools and the open space and the, the, the neighbourhood centres, the shops that went with that, but also the biomedical campus, which was part of it. So bringing together the, uh, talked about Abcam, talking about um, Papworth Hospital, talking about AstraZeneca coming in. This was delivered by the planners working in local government in the councils and the planners and the architects and the master planners and the landscape architects and the engineers. I have to say engineers because uh, I'll get told off that there's obviously sessions later about engineering and transport and highways. But all these different built environment professionals working together to create what is now a thriving community on the south side of Cambridge, which will then develop further with a new station coming in. But it's not just about the physical uh, building that's going there. We spend a lot of time thinking about the future, about how we construct things. As a company, we have three factories that produce timber panel, timber panels to, 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 to deliver those housings on site. And we're spending an awful lot of time thinking about the way that they're constructed, the way they're transported around the country, and also thinking about the net zero, the car net, carbon journey that we are looking at doing, both with the building regulations that are set by government, but thinking about how we can improve the carbon, uh, embedded carbon within the houses, how we can improve the carbon that's used through the running, which also then has an impact on running costs for residents when they move in. So as a company, and I'm getting involved in thinking, of, thinking about this with our technical team, about how we take apart the houses that we construct and put them back together to improve that carbon efficiency and running, thinking about how we will need to live moving forward. So from a plan, you've got this broad range of topics that we can get involved with at different stages of career. But this is, this is a really interesting one, because we're doing uh, some case studies at the moment on site where we're delivering houses that have zero bills in terms of heating and running because of the way we've been able to construct and change it. So all the way through the planning process, it's broader than just a planning application with the pretty colours of a house on the outside and putting it in with a, with a few supporting statements. It's thinking about how we construct it, how we transport it, how we're thinking about getting the, the, the employees on site in terms of the, the, the actual construction phase, but then also about how people will live there and live their lives moving forward. So, for me, planning and being as part of the built environment, whether that's as an engineer, as an architect, uh, as a landscape architect, as a, a, a water professional thinking about drainage, you are involved in the creation of new places, either where you live or where you work. Creating the future of that place, thinking about where things are located. But you are there to have a positive impact on people's lives. No one goes to work to create a rubbish development, no one goes, goes to work to, to make people's lives a misery. You are going to work either as a council planning officer, uh, or as a, as a planner in the private sector or one of the other professions I mentioned, to create a positive impact and to leave a legacy, but making a change and making a difference on a daily basis, trying to continually improve things for the developments that you're proposing, developments you're building, and then fundamentally on the lives of people going forward. So I did uh, uh, geography, history and economics at A level, and then I wanted to do campsite planning as my main degree, then town planning as my second degree. And then I've worked through local government, starting off as an assistant planner, and town planning assistant, I think it was, moving up to become head of planning in a few authorities and part of a corporate management team. 
of a council overseeing a much broader range of built environments as well as car parks and castles and things like that that I had to manage. Before then I went into the private sector um, and uh, we've spoken a little bit about some of the schemes on, on the south of Cambridge but I've been involved in schemes um, across the country now um, and being able to go into places uh, talking, I can see various councillors here, but talking to councillors of all and Andrews of all different uh, political persuasions and none, depending on the, on the type of party, um, and working with them to understand their vision for their area and then working with them to, to create it. But fundamentally, it's about having a jolly good career and a fantastic and enjoyable one. And you need to decide what really interests you to be able to help you think about the type of career that you want to take forward. The key to uh, much of this and the role that the plan can really play is creating communities. So Adam uh, from Instinctively Green is going to talk about, uh, with an example, exactly that process of creating a community. Adam. Um, my, my name is Adam Broadway and I run a company called Instinctively Green um, who set up about 15 years ago to look at sustainability, which is a very big topic, particularly around the, the, the built environment. But what I want to do is to build on what um, the previous speaker, Andrew, has talked about as around creating places. So some of you might not know, but Cambridge is the host and the, the venue for a very um, appreciated and award-winning scheme called Marmalade Lane. So I'd like to use that as a bit of an example about showing how, what you can do in the development world about creating fantastic places. Before we start, though, any hands up, anybody in the room, if you were given the opportunity, would like to design or build your own home? Ooh, lovely, lots of you, brilliant. How many of you probably haven't done it yourself, or do you, if you have, great, or do you know anybody who has commissioned or designed or built their own home? A good number. That's very good. That, I'll tell you, in the professional world, when I do that, there are more hands that went up in this room than they do in, in professional settings. So that is fantastic. So what I'd like to do is to talk about um, a place called Marmalade Lane. Um, it's named that because the people who now live there named it that. They, they had an argument with the planners about the naming of their scheme, and they won. Um, it is Cambridge's first um, co-housing project. Now, apologies for the terminology, but a co-housing project is, is, is an intentional community. It's when people come together to commission and design a place that they want to live in. It consists of 42 homes. It was brilliantly promoted by Cambridge City Council, who were the landowner. And all the people who live there own either the freehold, the house itself, or a lease in the property. But all the open space and the big communal house which, um, where they have events is owned by the company of which they are shareholders. Bit complex, happy to explain in a bit more detail later. But the principle of it is about coming together and setting the standards and the design criteria for you, the place that you want to live in. There are some really important kind of key features in this, if I show you on this slide. But on the bottom side of the slide, you'll see the, there's a, a road. That's actually the guided um, busway just above King's Hedges Road. And if you went to the north of the site, that's on the A14. So this is come Cambridge North, um, Northwest Territory, um, if you know your geography around Cambridge. The key features of this development uh, if you look to the south, you see this lovely green space, and it is to the south, and the group wanted to have a really large open space that they could basically um, utilise with planting trees, apple trees, pear trees, have an allotment space, and it's a space where children, adults, or whatever can mingle and use. And that's a really important part of this. You'll see in the centre, just up towards where the two a couple of the terraces are, a kind of greenish building with a flat roof. That's called a common house. We actually call it, we're in a grand hall. They call it a grand hall. And it's such a big space where basically you can hold events, have meals, it's got a very big kitchen. And it's a place where you meet and greet. The third, the third key feature is you'll see to the top, there's a long terrace and, 
and a short kind of road area in between it and the, and the terrace below, and that's called the lane. And the crucial thing about the lane is again, it's where people can safely um, uh, carry out activities, particularly young children and things, under the visibility of the people who are living around in those homes. So all these kind of key features are quite common in what's called a co-housing scheme. But what was brilliant was my role was to facilitate that, was to take people who are probably, like a lot of you in the room, not experts at all in this, on a journey to actually to create this scheme. And, <clears throat> and I say, well, we're delighted that it's kind of multi-award winning. This is a picture down the lane. It's actually a road. You could technically drive down it if you wanted to. We get a few um, odd looks from neighbours and things. And more importantly, you can get a, an ambulance or a police car or a fire engine down the, the lane. But if you look closely, you'll see this little goals, this, um, the markings on, on the ground, the hopscotch and things. It's become a playground for children, but, but again, within the visibility of their parents. Again, some more images, but just showing the kind of um, key features on the left of that, that, that space being used. And on the right, what you see is a little bit of pri private space. So these are private homes. They all have their own bathrooms, kitchens, bedrooms, all those types of things. But they have a little bit of private space just to kind of do things that they want themselves, rather than the shared activities that go with the rest of the scheme. So the, the key thing, I would say, in this, this is about people. These, this group wanted to live here. They wanted to design and set the standards of, of the scheme that they live in. And co-housing is a, a newish idea in the, in the UK. If you see that little graph on the bottom um, table here, on the, on the right hand side, this compares the amount of what we call custom-built, self-built housing that's done across Europe. And you'll see the little red mark, and that's the UK. And that represents about five to seven, ten percent Five to seven percent of homes in the UK are built are custom and self-built. Whereas if you go to Austria and Germany, it's seventy to, to half about uh, to fifty percent. It's a really new area in this country, and we're keen to explore it by having examples like Marmalade Lane. The principle of this slide is to say that to deliver something like Marmalade Lane and to get the home that these people wanted. You have to go through a process. And you'll learn from every, anything you will do that there are processes that should really be followed to enable you to get to your end goal. The starting point was to convince the decision makers, so the, some of the politicians, the councillors, the officers, that this was worth doing, because it's different. This site was going to be sold to a house builder like Andrew, um, but the house building market collapsed in 2008 and the site was available. So we managed to use the opportunity to convince the councillors to do something different. And they very luckily said, have a go, we'll put a bit of money aside for you to, to facilitate it and this is the result. Again, I won't go through the whole slide, but you'll see a section in red and it's the brief. Now, I know there's lots of students in the room but when you get a project, one of the most things you no doubt will panic about is what is the brief? What's, what am I being asked to do? So when you commission a building or a project, you need a very clear brief. And we spent nine months writing a brief for this project with the people who were going to live there. And that was critical because basically if you have a poor brief, you'll get a poor building. And if that is really worth the energy and the time putting into the scheme. So why do we need innovative housing projects? The challenge I would say is that <coughs> Cambridge as a city is fundamentally important to the economics of the UK. There's some incredible statistics at the moment, and I think um, they still stand, is that the UK, Cambridge is the only other city outside of London that um, contributes to our, our GDP. So it's vital that we basically help and ensure that the city survives and, and flourishes. Therefore, we need to have a whole range of new housing of different types. Not just housing that can be bought, there's a lot of housing, and people in this room, will, no, no doubt will, will find out, that housing is very expensive if you're going to buy it. So we need a range of housing options. 
The beauty of this model is that it allows other choices, so it, it provides another idea about how do we provide housing for people who want to live in Cambridge, but maybe not be able to afford it, to buy it outright, etc. So it's another way of providing um, uh, good quality accommodation. And one of the crucial things about the group, and I think it's, it's getting more and more relevant, is that people want a sustainable home. It's a, it's a slightly misused word, sustainability, but it's very important. People, at the moment, because of the cost of living, energy prices, things like this, people want something which is much more affordable to live in. So you need to build it better. You need to spend money on the building to make sure that it, it helps you to reduce your kind of, um, living costs. So how did I get involved? So this is the careers path. So I studied geography at uh, A level. Uh, apparently, I did two other subjects, didn't do very well in them. And I then went to Oxford Poly, as it was, and uh, it's now Oxford Brooks, and did town planning. It was while I was there in the um, late 80s that homelessness in the UK was becoming a, a major issue. And I became very concerned about that and wanted to do more about trying to resolve a housing crisis that we were starting to create. I got lucky, and I'm sure in your careers, you need to take your, your, the opportunities of luck in your career decision making. I then joined a housing association, and they gave me a fantastic learning path, and I then went on to other organisations as a direct, director of development. But as I say, for me, one of the drivers is this, is that homelessness basically, I, I think, is abominable in a, in a society uh, of, um, that we live in in the UK. Why on earth are people having to sleep rough when we have one of the most um, uh, uh, highest uh, economies in, in, in the world? I think it's still abominable. And that, for me, personally, was a driver. I wanted to help in some way to actually to resolve this kind of issue. But one of the crucial things, again, when I was looking after developments and getting houses built, was this. Now this is a housing scheme. I apologise if anybody actually lives there, because I'm sure it's a lovely home and probably lovely neighbours. But this is what the planning system can allow to happen. And actually, for me, that's not right. But, um, we need to think much more about the places that we create, places which allow us to engage with our neighbours, feel much more safe, secure, and places that you want to, want to live in, not just a number. A local scheme which might be relevant to um, when I was working at Need Housing and Accent was um, in Forborn. Uh, if anybody knows South Cambridge quite well in Forborn, there used to be a council estate called the Wimmel Estate. It was a, a systems built, it was made up of concrete. The concrete was failing. People's bills um, 10, 15 years ago were horrendous even then. And the place was basically falling apart. So basically, through thinking and some new vision, we created this. And again, it's about, in a careers context, is thinking about your opportunities, is thinking about doing something better than what may have happened or what can, what can happen. And I think that's a crucial part of wanting to do something much better and create better places. The other thing I want to stress is sustainability. And I say my company is focused on trying to create more sustainable places. Because crucially, we do not have three planets. We are using resources at three times the level of the, what we have. And we really ha have to stop this. We have to think much more about what we're doing to reduce our carbon impact and reduce the, the resources that we have. And it's great to hear uh, Andrew talking about a very large company addressing, trying to address this issue. But we've all got responsibility here to do this. I will end by saying <clears throat> what's crucial that I think in, in your career path is have a find your passion. Find something you're really, really interested in, whatever you want, want to do. Embrace learning. It's really important. We're always learning. And don't be afraid to ask. Hopefully you're in a structure where there are people that will help, but find that help if you need it. Do your data, do your bit of research, make sure you've got evidence based in what you're doing and test those ideas um, with your colleagues, find, find solutions. You need to be financially savvy because unfortunately everything costs 
but that, that can be resolved, but have that in, in the foremind. And be practical. Come up with practical ideas. People don't want lots of jargon and lots of very complicated things. People want things simple and easy to use. Whatever you do, enjoy it, and ideally make a difference. This is my last slide, and this again goes back to Marmalade Lane. So one of the awards it won was about creating a place about well-being, health and well-being. They are critical about in the results of making a great place. We have a, a very um, complex health system, health service, under huge pressures. If we can create better places and take the pressure off that, then we have a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. But let's also hear from somebody who's perhaps at an early stage. So for those of you who are thinking about this, what does this career look like? What are some of the steps to enter into this career? And Jay Barrett is a young planner at Savills, and she has a fantastic title to her, which is, um, you don't have to see the full staircase to take the first step, uh, my geography journey. Jay, please, tell us about your geography journey. Hi, um, so my name's Jade, um, I'm a graduate planner at Savills, um, and I think one thing that I realised when I was in your position is that I didn't know what I wanted to do, and that is completely fine, and I think I just wanted to come today to talk to you about my journey and how I ended up where I am, um, and to really just kind of give you that perspective that it's fine to not know what you want to do yet, and that some, coming to something like this is a great opportunity to explore different opportunities because um, it definitely would have helped me um, when I was in your position. So this is a bit about um, my journey. So um, I studied um, my GCSEs in the northeast of England. Um, that's where I did my GCSEs, A-levels. Um, I then went to study at Durham, um, studied human geography there. Graduated in 2022 and then started my role as a graduate planner here in Cambridge in October 2022. So then my journey to geography and planning. Um, so being quite frank about it, I chose to study geography because I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do at GCSE. Um, and I think there's quite a stereotype that you choose to do geography because it gives you the opportunity to explore lots of different options. But it was through that decision that I realised how much I actually loved the variety that it offered, um, the ability to study lots of different things across a large range of sub-disciplines. Um, I don't know if anyone's watched it, but the main thing that kind of grabbed me was when I was sat in a geography lesson and we watched the TED talk on the sustainable city of Curitiba in Brazil. Um, it discussed all sustainable principles, how everyone lives 400 metres from a bus stop, um, how you work, live, and play in the same area. Um, and it was from then that I became fascinated by the ability to make positive change for people um, and for the environment and those two things working together. Um, I then chose to study geography at uni um, because it, it enabled me to explore these different options. Um, and it was there that I recognised and realised my desire to study urban environments. Um, so, Geography allows you at uni, like I say, I, I studied economic geography, urban geography, political geography, cultural, social, anything. It covers a broad kind of spectrum and that enables you to kind of try different things and that's where you can kind of really explore what you're interested in. Um, so I picked up on the ideas of density, regeneration and urban crowds in my dissertation. Um, and studying human geography allows you to kind of specialise into that area that you're really interested in. But even then, I still didn't know when I was fascinated by kind of urban development, um, making sustainable places, I still didn't know what that career path was. I was fascinated by it, but I couldn't, I couldn't name a job title. And I think that comes down to the fact that when I was at school and when I was at uni, we didn't have talks like this where people would come and talk about the importance of planning um, and the opportunities that there are within it. And it really does, if you, if you really want to make a positive change for people and the environment, it really does give you that opportunity. 
once I graduated from um, uni, I then started searching for master's degrees and graduate positions. I wasn't entirely sure which route I wanted to go down. And again, I think that just shows that you don't have to have it all figured out. Um, I left uni without a plan, really. Um, a lot of my friends had graduate positions secured or were about to be starting master's uh, degrees. I really still didn't have anything. I wasn't fully set up, but again, I just want, like, want to come and tell you that that's fine. Um, and everything will work out if you work hard and you put the effort in. Um, so I applied for various different roles, like I said, various different master's degrees. Saw this opportunity, um, Savills in Cambridge, um, as a graduate planner, and was thankfully successful. Um, I moved down here in October 2022. And again, just wanted to tell you that I went, I went from, for those of you that are quite well aware, the northeast. I grew up in Northumberland to go to Durham for uni is not that big of a jump distance wise. Coming to Cambridge was quite, quite a big deal um, and it has been challenging but again I would just say to throw yourself at it and give yourself the opportunities because if you don't you're never going to know whether you can or can't achieve something. And like I said, I started my role in October 2022 and I haven't looked back since. Been learning about planning, been learning about the working environment, everything in between. And I'm now also studying part time for my master's as well, so I've been able to do both at the same time. Um, and I think that's something, again, that I would have liked to know was a possibility when I was um, looking at all these different options. So, what I would say to myself at school. I'd say do as much work experience as possible. Um, so I didn't do enough work experience, but I think the importance of doing it is that you can rule things out more than anything. And I think I never realized that. I always thought I had to have an interest in what I was doing work experience on, but sometimes the best forms of work experience are those that you can rule out because you actually think that's not for me. I don't like that at all. Um, I think it's okay to be nervous about going to uni. I know we've got people in kind of different positions and different situations, um, but at the end of the day, everyone is in the same position. Um, it will be challenging. Um, I think for those of you who are looking at unis, looking at the collegiate system is very beneficial in making you feel like you've got that home away from home. Um, I'd say join every club, society and sports team possible. Um, just kind of get yourself out there and try lots of different things. Um, but ultimately you always have your eye on the long term goal, whether that's now, whether that's a bit in the future, but at the end of the day you, you're at uni to get that degree and to then use that as a stepping stone. But ultimately enjoy it. Um, it's crazy to think I left uni over a year ago. Um, I still feel, like I'm, still feel like I'm there, but um, yeah, definitely enjoy it. In terms of personal statements, um, just obviously when you're looking to Right then, there's a few things that I um, thought that I've been told by teachers and various people that really kind of stuck out to me. Um, so don't start with ever since I was young, because realistically ever since I was young I wanted to be a planner probably isn't right. <laughs> um, to start with something that's going to grab the reader's attention, um, something that really sells you for who you are. Um, the biggest thing for me was if you don't have an example, don't write it. Because I used to waffle, and if you don't back it up with examples of where you've used that in practice, or where you've kind of challenged yourself or done something, then it's not really as convincing. Watch the TED talk, obviously, like I say. Um, but ultimately, remember, remember that unis want to know about you and what you've achieved, what you recognise, um, self-reflection, you recognise your strengths, you recognise your weaknesses, and um, ultimately your passions. And if you haven't noticed from the first slide, I love a quote, so I would recommend ending with a quote. So in our changing world, nothing changes more than geography is the quote that I used. Um, and I think that kind of underpins everything about what we do and how much change there is. So then in terms of um, career-wise, so I think there's an expectation that the career ladder might look like that, but in reality it really doesn't and you can go side to side, backwards, forwards, and a bit rich come for me very early in my career, but I think even when I was at uni, I, I pictured the image on the left and got kind of disheartened and down, frustrated when you kind of get rejected from different grad schemes or things aren't quite working the way you thought it would.
but realistically it doesn't look like that and everything will always work out if you if you really put the effort in you try different things um, and you throw yourself at it so then just a bit in terms of um, why Savills um, so Savills is one of the world's leading property agents um, one of the biggest things for me that I've found since I've started is the quality graduate support. We've got an amazing HR team. Um, they're always willing to support you, to help you out. And I think the main thing I can say that I didn't realise is how many different routes there were into the company. Um, the fact that I am now studying for my master's part-time alongside my full-time role um, is a great opportunity. And it's something that I didn't know about. So we've got lots of different routes um, into the company, so you can come do summer schemes, work experience, even from your age now in school. Um, you can also do work experience while you're at uni or take a placement year with us. Um, we've had a lot of sandwich year students who have come and done that. Um, you've also got apprenticeships, so if you don't want to go to uni full time and you want to get straight into work, we've got a lot of people who come straight out of school, um, and now we offer those opportunities where you can um, work alongside getting your degree. Well, you've got the graduate roles, which is what I did, so I've done the, my undergraduate course and I'm now studying towards my master's through the company, like I say. Um, so it's just that there's lots of different routes and I think it's just kind of recognising that because to be um, a planner like me, you need the RTPI accreditation, which geography doesn't have, but I still think geography is a great subject to give you that stepping stone and there's so many key skills that I learned and now being able to kind of develop that and put that alongside my masters um, is great. Uh, we also have global opportunities, so we've got offices all over the world um, and massively supportive colleagues. Um, my team are great, office is great, the whole company, everyone kind of connects and works together and it's a really, it's a really great thing. You can be working with someone in a completely different office um, and no two days are the same. Um, there's clear career progression once you get in, there's a career pathway that you can see and kind of keep working towards. Um, competitive salary and a drive for sustainability as well, so um, that's just a bit about why Savills. So yeah, thank you. Um, I'll stay outside if anyone wants to ask me any questions about planning or geography, uni, anything in between. Um, I'm happy to take any questions outside after Thank you. Thank you very much. Probably a good thing to do is to hear, hear about things from the horse's mouth. Why did you get into planning, Tom? I didn't mean to. <laughs> That's the serious answer. Um, I did geography, like most people in planning have done, um, and I loved volcanoes. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do something with volcanoes. As sort of Jay said earlier, I didn't actually like volcanoes when I was about them as much as I thought I did. Um, enjoyed the planning module and then kind of went from there. I actually didn't really do planning straight out of university, I just did some careers beforehand, but yeah, kind of fell into it and here I am now. Thank you. Jake? Yeah, so um, I was quite interested in the built environment from a relatively early age and uh, I ended up studying town planning at university undergraduate at Oxford Brooks. I went on to do a, a master's uh, for, from there, really. So, yeah, just just sort of had a awareness of it uh, sort of relatively early on, and just just pursued it from there, really. Uh, for me, I was quite similar to Jade in that I really didn't know about planning, um, especially not transport planning when I left school. But I knew that I wanted to study or continue learning about geography and what sort of careers I could give. So I originally started working as a cartographer, so I'm a map maker. Um, and then again, I sort of fell into transport planning by accident because I was trying out lots of different careers. So I also tried um, some sort of FADO finance careers and then uh, I did a few months in accountancy as well. And then really realized that my passion was geography and that I needed to get back to studying and working in the geography field. Um, and that's when I looked at graduate schemes similar to Jade and um, transport planning. What did you study at university? What did you do in apprenticeship? I went to university, I went to the University of Exeter and I studied physical geography, which is quite controversial because the majority of my team and people in yeah, the built environment tend to have studied human geography. But 
equally I like volcanoes, so. <laughs> I think I've, well, I've inadvertently answered the question already. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I did an undergraduate degree in town planning at Oxford Brooks uh, University and uh, I then did my masters uh, in town planning there as well. It was like a combined uh, undergrad and masters uh, programme. So um, yeah, that's where I studied. Tom. Um, I did geography at Nottingham Trent. Um, it was like a mix between uh, human and physical, so I got to learn about everything, but I didn't really like sand dunes that much, so I knew that human geography was best. Um, and then I waited six years to do a master's um, afterwards, because I tried a couple of places, but I did a master's at South Bank, I finished that a couple of years ago. So. What is your favourite, most surprising, or source of pride part of your job? It's seeing something be built that you've worked on for ages, so it's, you'll have a scheme and you know, you can see that it's going to benefit people and it's going to really have an impact on the local area and it's taking all the months and months of conversations and negotiations and then seeing it be an end product at the end where people are talking about it and everyone's really excited about it, that's probably the thing that I enjoy the most. Thank you. Eric? Yeah, similar to Tom, really, it's just seeing something tangible at the end that you've worked and spent a lot of time on over over many months and years in many instances, uh, you know, come to fruition and kind of seeing the role that it's playing on a, on a daily day-to-day -day basis. I, I, I personally have worked on uh, quite a few uh, projects looking to provide sort of more stable accommodation for homeless people. Uh, since the onset of the COVID pandemic, there was a bit of government funding released for that, and uh, I kind of led planning applications for a few of those projects. Um, and it's, those have been built pretty, pretty, pretty quickly to deal with, obviously, a, a very you know, acute need. And uh, yeah, I'm just very proud to see those kind of come through and uh, to see the good that they're, that they're doing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm very similar as well in that it's a great feeling to see something that you've worked on actually be built out in the end. Um, but equally, it's a great opportunity to work on a massive variety of projects from small to large. So you could work on a, a small resi, residential scheme of say 30 to 50 homes compared to, I've worked on projects um, for size of nuclear power stations. So there are a massive variety of projects you can get involved with. So that's the thing that gives me the biggest kick from my work. What advice would you give to those interested in a similar career, applying for university, and don't have any much of an idea yet? Uh, I think, for me, the biggest thing is that you have to be studying something that you genuinely love. So, I never had careers talks like this either, and I was offered some pretty bad career advice when I was at uni, so I ended up applying not for geography, I applied for natural sciences because I also studied biology, chemistry and maths and my career advice was you'd be the, a great natural scientist but geography was my main passion. So yeah, at the last minute I ended up switching all of my UCAS applications to geography. So I would say no matter what advice you get today, uh, you've got to follow your passions. Yeah, um, in terms of advice really I'd sort of suggest to any students really, um, for any area that you might be interested in, seek work experience um, from be it, be it planning or any any aspect of the built environment, you know, go to, uh, you know, companies and local authorities will be will be willing to, you know, accommodate that, that be it even for a few days just so you can get a flavour of what it's like. I mean, I personally, before I went to, before I went to university, I, I did, you know, a, a few weeks work experience in and local authority and in private practice as well, which really helped to, uh, you know, um, affirm that that's the route that I wanted to go down. So, yeah, don't don't be afraid to, to go out there and, and ask uh, for a few days work experience in wherever it might be, wherever you're interested in, just to, yeah, give yourself a, a good understanding of what's out there. Thank you. And Tom? I think I would just say don't worry. It's the best advice I could give because you might really think you're going to enjoy something and you won't and don't worry about not putting, don't try not to put all of your eggs in one basket. A sort of a mixture between the two questions from Jodie and Jodie is that 
don't, you, you know, do both. Like, if you want to do it, do it. Just put, like, just try whatever you want to do and, like, move forward. Like Jane said, you might not enjoy it, so just try and think about what you do then enjoy and then, yeah, move forward from that. That's probably the best advice I can just basically don't want to. What do you do on a typical day? Um, a lot. Answer emails. Um, <laughs> argue with people. Um, help people. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do loads of different stuff in a day. Um, but sort of the most basic thing is assess how many applications that come in, the things that all of these guys have put in um, over the sort of the weeks that all their hard work has gone through. And I basically assess it and um, see what's wrong with it. Um, no, I'm joking. No, most of the time it's pretty good, but um, yeah, I just normally assess it and um, look about trying to get it through for approval if we can do. Thank you. Jake? Yeah, so uh, similar to Tom a lot, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, in terms of a typical day, I guess uh, it, can, it can vary because, as Jody mentioned, we're, we're involved in a variety of projects from residential to commercial, education, healthcare, you name it. So it can, it can vary, but uh, I guess the, the, the bones of it really is uh, assessing sites really for uh, their, their kind of planning constraints and, uh, and potential as well, uh, and also helping our clients to um, bring something forward which um, is going to meet with the local authorities approval and, and meets everything that it's going that, that needs to, both from a physical perspective but also from a um, placemaking kind of perspective as well. Uh, so in transport planning, the main technical work that we undertake uh, is around creating transport assessments. So we tend to do all of the transport um, sort of digging and problem solving that is involved with planning new developments. So on a daily basis, we could be um, writing reports that display how a development is going to impact highways. Um, we'll be conducting analysis and modelling to show sort of the nitty gritty parts of um, our analysis and also a fair bit of sort of client and stakeholder engagement liaison as well. Um, so yeah, good good communication skills and ways help. Why did you choose the private yeah. sector of the public? Uh, I sort of fell into this role again. Um, I did I did actually apply for a public sector role as well, um, but I think for the private sector work, I just really like the variety of different schemes that I can work on, um, and equally the sort of variety of people that you can build networks with, because I can be speaking to environmental advisors one day and civil engineers another day in my role, so I think it's, yeah, private sector is really good for a big range of different projects and different experiences. Jake? Yeah, similar in terms of the variety really, um, not just in terms of projects but also geographies. So we work across, I personally work across a, a variety of uh, pretty much all, all throughout the East Anglia really and every district authority has its different challenges uh, and, and, and kind of things to, to contend with. So it's it's really that, uh, that kind of variety, uh, not just from a from a, from a site level kind of perspective, but also uh, from a from a wider uh, policy perspective, different policies to deal with across different authorities, and um, yeah, it's, it's our role to, to advise our, our clients to you know best meet those, and when you know in, in other situations where those policies perhaps can't be fully met, working with local authorities to to come to a a solution which hopefully works for everybody. Thank you. Finally, Tom. I fell into it, um, a bit like Jodie, so I didn't really understand the differences between public and private sector when I first went into planning. Um, I do now. Um, and yeah, I just kind of fell into it and it's so, a bit like these guys, planning is just so varied. You literally, I mean, you go to listed buildings one day and then you're just in someone's back garden with a dog jumping up at you the next. Like it is, it's so varied, it's great. So. Um, yeah, I just sort of fell into the public sector. So I'm delighted that we've been partnering with the, this afternoon with the Royal Geographical Society and we have Professor Joe Smith here, Director of the Royal Geographical Society. We've heard a lot about geography. Joe, tell us a bit about geography as a profession and a discipline. 
Thank you very much, Andrew. So I come from a 250-year line of clockmakers. So I'm in a lovely lecture theatre, but the first thing I notice is that there's no clock. So um, we haven't got time to sort that out, but the audience participation here is that um, if you raise one hand, I'll know you want to ask a question. If you raise two hands, it's, Joe, you've had five minutes, we've had enough. Okay? So I've only got a few things to say, um, partly because I've been helped by the fact that people have already said a lot of the really, I thought, important things I had to say, uh, and they've done, I think, a better job of it, so thank you. And particularly Jade, I loved your title and what you did with it. I found it really inspiring, and actually it knits well with some things I think I'll, I'll add in to use the five minutes I didn't know I had. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about time and change and technology, but also about the future. Now, um, I wouldn't get out of here and keep my job if I didn't tell you something about the Royal Geographical Society, but I'm going to use um, an analog technology to uh, make a shortcut. No one in my position should come to something like this without some free pencils, so I need to do that. No one in your position should leave without taking one, they're easily identified, they're bright red, they've got hashtag choose geography on one side and our website on the other. There you will find a very clear account of how we can all help you in your careers with geography. So there are masses of, uh, of learning materials to support teachers and learners on their journey with the subject. And um, uh, I don't think I should be caught publicly saying it's a shortcut, but yes, it's a shortcut. Um, there's some great resources to help you through um, your journey uh, through the lessons in, in A-levels, but also we support teachers and learners at university as well, and professions, so we support the whole life course of the geographer. We've been doing a few other things for the last 200 years, and one of them is supporting expeditions. So, uh, it struck me that I didn't really want to do a PowerPoint, but I did want to have uh, uh, some kind of prop to help me through, and the prop I've got is blue marble. And um, although we weren't uh, sponsors of the uh, first trip to the moon, um, we looked on with interest, and we welcomed them back and gave them a gold medal. Not quite as good as it being ours, but never mind. Um, now, 10 years before they set out, the International Geophysical Year, um, sought to try to understand the world as a single system. Geographers were right at the heart of that, bringing both human geography, physical geography to bear all over the world. It was the first truly international um, uh, uh, effort at understanding Earth systems and the interaction between Earth and, and human systems. Just a little before that, the astronomer Fred Hoyle said, the moment that we have a picture of the, the planet from space, we would have created an idea more powerful than any in human history. I think that's profoundly true. I don't think we know exactly what that idea is yet. So this is where I want to um, uh, both say something about what geography can do for you and also argue with Greta Thunberg, which is a very brave thing to do. So in one sentence, what I think geography can do for you is make you rich and save the world, okay? I only exaggerate slightly because um, what's certainly true uh, about geography, if you look at the stats, is that it has one of the best um, uh, and consistent set of results in terms of student satisfaction, but also employability as you leave. And that's not because someone had a fond memory of a field trip when they were interviewing people uh, for a job. It's a, a very particular set of skills that um, this discipline offers, whether it's at school or university. I've only got a few seconds left, so I'm going to climb Everest in that time. So one of the uh, expeditions we did sponsor was the 1953 uh, Everest expedition. So the first people to succeed in climbing that mountain uh, were uh, planned that expedition 
in the Royal Geographical Society. You can come and see a two metre boat by two metre plaster model they used to plan it. John Hunt, the leader of the expedition, said life is meeting, that you need to get together and talk if you're going to make a change in the world. And um, some of the key things they needed to go from the 22 expedition, which was also sponsored by the Society, and you can see these amazing photographs that are the first images of that mountain range that helped them then make the maps and plan the trip. But they're also just very beautiful. Between 22 and 53, what did they need? They needed technology, they needed good systems and analysis, they needed to understand both the human and technical and scientific environments they were working in and how to work together, and they needed, above all, teamwork. And I think geography does an exceptionally good job of, uh, of coaching people in that that key intellectual uh, kit bag uh, of, of um, things that you need to address a really dramatic challenge. Now, um, actually I don't entirely argue with Greta, I agree with her on the core points. We've got a heck of a lot to do, and we've got to do it in a really short space of time, and we've not done this before, and we don't know how to do it. However, the bit I want to argue with is the sense in which this is a really grim and difficult time to be born into, to enter into adulthood. My grandfather, who I agreed with on many things and loved very much, um, sat me on his knee when I was small and said, I'm really sorry, Joe, I lived through the most exciting time in human history. Everything was invented. He, was, he, was a, he, he loved aeroplanes, he was a radio ham, Telephones were shared across the world for the first time in his lifetime. I kind of get his point. But we went in, his li in my lifetime from this to this to pretty well everyone over 12 in certainly the developed world and actually a good portion of the global south walking around with a computer more powerful than the one that took people to the moon and a shoot and edit suite more powerful than the best Hollywood film director was working with in 1985. Think about what that can do. It's a communications tool and an analysis tool, and everyone's got one. What if we went towards the objectives we've got in front of us with teamwork, technology, and I think above all, an ambition that we should get to the end of our lives, get to the end of this century, which by the way, I'll have probably checked out by then, but get to the end of this century leaving humanity in much better shape than it was when it entered it. Now, I would be very pessimistic about that prospect if I hadn't heard someone like Jay describe her journey today. Actually, if I hadn't thought about, as I was, as I left my house, coincidentally, in Bateman Street, and cycled here, perhaps a little late, and uh, thought, actually, how much has this place changed since I was a student? And I just thought, actually, solar panels on four of the houses. Um, uh, this is now a completely uh, safe place to cycle for, for kids and older people. Um, and uh, I, I could go through a long list of ways in which the opportunities to make a more sustainable world are just within reach. And built environment professions and geography as a subject are going to be really important and valuable, and by the way, well rewarded, careers to enter into. So I wish you all good luck, and I would be very disappointed if you don't walk out of that door thinking, hmm, I think I'll choose geography to pay my bills and save the world. Thanks for listening.